November 21st, I had the fortunate opportunity to witness and be part of a historic event for the U.S. Army Special Forces, the 50th anniversary in commemoration of the Sante Raid. The Sante Raid is one of the most well-known, most well-executed rescue operations related to the Vietnam War. It was a tight collaboration among the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Also known as Operation Ivory Coast or Operation Kingpin, it aimed to rescue as many as 70 American prisoners of war from their Vietnamese captors near Hanoi, North Vietnam. Braves from Soldier Systems Daily. I'm here with Eric Lawrence VSS. I'm so you're participating in the 50th anniversary of the, 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 the Sante Raid. Kevlar on. See how things are properly done in the world, in true tactical situations, in true evolved training evolutions. In part one of our Sante Raid series, I shared with you how fortunate I felt to be part of the historic event. Well, believe it or not, my team, we all got ready. We, I carried nine millimeter, some, some carried sort of shotguns and whatever, but we were swaying close. And we had no officer on my team, so it was stand and listen to me. We saw how veterans commemorated and celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Sante Raid. <laughs> like a family reunion, it was a mixture of both serious and fun emotions, nostalgia and sometimes just plain fooling around, veterans style. You had to fly a straight line right. because you had 500 foot thing. Yeah. If you made a turn, 
that thing would yeah. swing yeah. like that yeah. and then go back and forth, back yeah. and forth until it would stabilize yeah. uh, several minutes later. Right. So, you scoot over? depending on, yeah. since you center. have to be yeah, picked up into the wind, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, sir. Right. You sit in the center? That, that's what directed uh, the... Uh, a documentary was filmed recreating the heroism of American soldiers in the November 21st, 1970 operation near Hanoi, North Vietnam to rescue American prisoners of war. These heroes helped recreate the raid for the documentary. They rehearsed and filmed what was part of 27 minutes that changed a lot of people's lives. It was a gathering where stories and experiences were shared. I consider it a great privilege to be in the same event, same room with these people. Next day, it was over. You know, the, the problem was over. But we got a critique from the battalion commander. And he's standing on a fucking, he's standing on a fucking stage with a cup of coffee, star critiques, and we're looking like we just came out of a fucking swamp. <laughs> if you missed out on part one of my coverage of the Sante event, please check out the link on the description below. In this episode, part two of our Sante 50th anniversary coverage, Sante Raider and author Terry Buckler gives us a full account of the raid. A great privilege for anyone and everyone of us who wants to know what bravery and love for country is all about. Big smile for me. So this morning with uh, Eric Lawrence VSS channel, we have one of the SF legends with me, a friend of mine, Terry Buckler, and uh, got his new book out, Who Will Go? Obviously, he was one of those. So we just spent the weekend working on a uh, 50th anniversary documentary, and uh, it looks good, even though he was in some of it. better with obviously he made me cut my beard which it was under under duress <laughs> also uh, uh, broke my fingernail so you can look at that but uh, Terry go ahead and you know give us a run through of what's going on here well uh, the uh, silent warrior foundation has uh, graciously hosted this event and they have created a, a replica of what we trained with while at Eglin for the uh, POW camp, Sante, and uh, the event has just been marvelous. They've done an excellent job of recreating what uh, we spent months training to do. So uh, I, my hat is off to them for what they've done and we certainly appreciate it. My background uh, is growing up on a small farm in mid-Missouri, drafted 1969, uh, joined, volunteered for Special Forces, went through the training of basic AIT and 
the jump school and then on to special forces training, the, uh, now called the Q course. Uh, to us it was just Camp McCall and pure hell, but other than that, <laughs> and then um, after the Q course, or Camp McCall, we went through our MOS training and then assigned to a group. I uh, had volunteered for Vietnam a couple of times but didn't get selected. I was then assigned to 7th group at Fort Bragg. At that time there was 6th and 7th group at Fort Bragg. The call went out on Smoke Bomb Hill by Bull Simons, who was a legend in uh, Special Forces, that he was looking for volunteers for a moderately hazardous mission. Arthur Bull Simons was a U.S. Army Special Forces Colonel, best known for leading the Sante Raid. He served 30 years as an officer spanning three wars. That's always stuck in my mind. Uh, <laughs> I went down, uh, I had been training up at Natahaley National Forest, came in for some supplies, and one of my buddies said, hey, the bull is down at the little White House and he's looking for volunteers. So I had some time to kill. I thought I'll go down and see what he's, what he's up to. Got down in there, there was over 500 seasoned Green Berets in the building. But uh, bull said if you wanted to uh, volunteer for it, be back here at 1300 hours and we would get you interviewed. Uh, the interview process consists of uh, two sergeant majors and uh, asking me different questions to kind of throw me off, and they, which they did. Uh, it was, the interview was not that long. I uh, left there thinking, well, at least I got a chance to interview. Went back to Natahaley, was doing our training up there in the mountains. Our colonel called me in a couple of days later and said, pack your bags, you're going to brag. Back to brag, and you uh, were selected for Bull's course. So, went back, wow. got all my shots, so I didn't have rabies, and uh, got the, uh, made a will, which for a training mission was a little unusual. I'd been on a couple of training missions before, but never really had to fill out a will for it. So. Uh, we got the wills done. I was in the advanced party. There was about 25 of us going down to Eglin Air Force Base. We initially trained at Eglin uh, Field Number Three, Auxiliary Field Three. Our, our first mission was to create the compound using uh, two befores and target cloth. So we spent about a week putting that together, and then uh, they. Uh, brought down some guys to sweep the uh, uh, talk building and once it was swept for listening devices and such we put a uh, Constantina roll, a couple, about three rolls of Constantina around it, put a field phone in the building out to the little uh, entryway and we guarded it 24 by 7. Now the difference there, we, we guarded it with live ammo it wasn't like we did at Bragg where you have five rounds of blanks. <laughs> so, uh, and we were told that if we needed to, shoot. <laughs> and so we kind of knew, hey, not only the people going in and out of that building, uh, at one time I had General Manor, who was the commander. I had uh, uh, Colonel Simons, Colonel Sidnor, uh, Dick Meadows, Major Dick Meadows and all going in at the same time. So it was pretty uh, tight group of uh, officers there that uh, were not, this was not their first rodeo. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started the training and uh, we initially did walkthroughs where we would just walk through and as a guard training, uh, guarding the building, I had the opportunity to, to work, train with them when I wasn't pulling guard duty or sleeping. And that went on for about, oh, I would say about three or four weeks. <clears throat> and uh, one day, uh, Colonel Sidner came, or Colonel Simons came by himself and wanted in the building. And so I called in. And uh, while we were waiting for someone to come out and escort him in, he asked me how things were going. And I thought, well, here's my opportunity to tell him where I'm at on this. And I said, well, Colonel, I didn't come down here to pull guard duty. I wanted to be on a mission. 
And he always had a little cigar in his mouth. He took that cigar out and said, young man, he said, you just hang in there. Things will be changing. Well, uh, he's a man of honor because about two weeks later, they made their first cut. And I was made uh, uh, RTO for the uh, red wine, which was one of the elements in the Sante raid. <coughs> and uh, I got out of pulling guard duty. So. <laughs> <laughs> Remember these terms, green leaf, red wine, and blue boy. These were the three key elements in the Sante Raid assault force. That's but, a hell of a way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never thought about it that yeah. way, but you're right. <laughs> um, uh, we trained. We did over 177 uh, rehearsals. We started out walking through it, then we would run through it. Uh, then we added uh, the um, choppers, which would bring us in and drop us off, and we'd exit the choppers and then do our part. Each, uh, each element, there were three elements, Blue Boy, Red Wine, and Greenleaf. <coughs> and Blue Boy was the one that landed inside the compound. Uh, they crashed uh, the, the chopper on purpose into the compound and their job was to eliminate the guards in the inside as quickly as they could. The planners of this mission uh, estimated that we had uh, about maybe a minute to make sure that we neutralized everybody on the, as a guard so they wouldn't uh, eliminate our POWs. So the uh, people on the Blue Boy, when they crashed, they, they cr came down hard, they uh, rotored in, but uh, they had a tree, and the tree was a little taller than they expected, so when they hit that tree with the rotors, it was like chopping wood. Mm -hmm. And some of the guys uh, got thrown out of the chopper. Uh, I think your friend Pat, yeah. Pat uh, Sinclair was one of those lucky guys, and uh, Pat was another one uh, had, that had no combat experience, but uh, got uh, initiated by fire that night. and. Uh, and went on to become a command sergeant major and spent 34 or 35 years yeah. serving this country. Uh, the, once we started the process of it, going through it, we, we picked up the speed and we started using live fire. So we really had to be pretty careful. Uh, for instance, Blue Boy would do their part and then Red Wine would do their part and because of the live fire, you didn't want other people out there in the area that might have gotten hit by accident. So everybody in Greenleaf was the other one. Hearing about the training, you'd think it would be clockwork in the actual mission, but we all know it never is. We had uh, uh, 56 men on the raid and so it wasn't a big group. And we uh, were training in Eglin. They came in one day and said, pack our bags, we're leaving. And so we packed our bags, not having any idea where we were headed off to. But uh, uh, they took us into uh, Eglin in a big hangar with a C-141 in it and took us in there and deuce and a half and covered up so nobody could see us going in or out. The security was extremely tight on this. I remember one day we were coming back from training uh, and there was three Air Force guys down there taking pictures of the choppers yeah. and such. All of a sudden two cars, black, big black sedans like the uh, CIA and those guys drive merged on them took their camera away, took their film out, and just opened it up and gave them their camera back. <laughs> yeah. So, and we had no idea that the security of those people were around us, but it was kind of reassuring to know that somebody had our backside. So, um, we left Eglin, and we flew into, flew, oh, we ended up in Norton, and then Alaska, and then Japan, and then, uh, we didn't know where we landed that night. It was about 1 and 1.30 when we got in to uh, Takli Air Force Base, we later found out. Takli was the CIA compound. They took us in there and uh, we spent the next three or four days just uh, uh, killing time basically. And what we were waiting for, we didn't know it at the time, but 
The uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff were the people that controlled this mission. This was the first time in the history of the military where the Joint Chiefs of Staff actually controlled the mission. Wow. So it, it was uh, very few people knew about it. And uh, so uh, what we were waiting for while at Tak Lee was for President Nixon at the time to give the final okay on it. So uh, on the 20th, uh, we had, uh, we, that, that day we were given a sleeping pill for lunch. Now I don't know how many of us took it, but I know I didn't and several of <laughs> the other guys didn't. But anyway, we figured right now if they're doing that, things are getting gonna get tight here. So that's a pretty good indication that everybody was getting pretty excited. We came, told us to be back at the auditorium. There was a little, excuse me, a little theater there that set about 100 people. Wasn't anything fancy, but uh, they told us to meet them back at that uh, at 1800 hours. So uh, we started wandering in there, and we got set down. And uh, uh, of course, everybody was a hug. Where are we going to do? Where are we going? There was a lot of people thought initially we were going to go to Cuba because the f flight time we were doing was three and a half to three hour flights, and from Eglin to Cuba that kind of fit the mold. But then when we landed in Tak Lee. The old timers over there said, we ain't going to <laughs> Cuba. <laughs> so uh, we were really not quite sure what the mission was going to be. It was, we, we did know, based on our training, that it was going to be some type of rescue. So um, uh, when Colonel Sidnor and, and Bull Simons came in that day, uh, they pulled down a big map of Hanoi, or North Vietnam. And they had Hanoi circled, and then up here in this other little corner they had Sante. Now, Sante is 23 miles from Hanoi, so uh, it was a, a pretty close little jog right there, and uh, Bull Simons uh, said, well, gentlemen, uh, we're going there tonight and with the intent of rescuing 60 to 70 POWs. <laughs> It was like dead silence in there for four to five seconds. And then it was like the roof went off. Guys were jumping up and hugging and saying, let's go get them. And then, you know, everybody was really excited about the opportunity to bring home POWs. Uh, right after that, Bull Simons told us that uh, this was a volunteer operation. Anybody that wanted to back out at this time it was should do it now. No one did. He told us we had a 50-50 chance of making it back. If there was going to be a security breach, we'd know it about the time the second chopper hit. And uh, our, our E and E plan was nothing fancy. It was to back up the Sante was in the bend of the Sog River, and Bull said we would stay together as a unit, back up, put our backs to the river and make it as bloody as we could for anybody that wanted to come across and get us. So that didn't sound like a real good idea to me, <laughs> but... <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> you know, you're, uh, you're up in the north. They estimated 12 to 20,000 NVA in the area. And uh, there were SAM sites and uh, anti-aircraft sites around. It was one of the most guarded airspaces in the world at that time. So... Um, Amazing. It was, it was. Uh, so uh, we were told what we were doing. They told us to go back to our belts, get our in from what we needed, and meet, us, meet them in the hangar. The hangar was where we had all of our equipment that had been brought with us. <coughs> so we went over there, uh, got all of our equipment on, checked our radios, checked for weapons and everything was working right. And uh, then we loaded, a, I think it was a 123 is what we loaded, or 130, I can't remember actually, from uh, Tak Lee, and we flew into uh, Udorn, which was just north a little bit. And uh, when we got to Udorn, our choppers were already on the tarmac, they were, engines were running, and they had already told us which chopper. There was uh, five HH-53s and one HH-3 on there. And the HH-3, we had tried using Hueys for this mission, but 
uh, because of the weight and the speed, the, uh, was, our mothership was a C-130. And we were to follow that bird, and the H H-3 was going to fly in the draft of it. Now, the, the 130 was flying at five speeds above stall speed, and the HH-3 was panting all the way. Under moon. <laughs> Under moon. No lights and no communications. From the time we left Hock, or Air, Eudorn, there was no type of communications at all. Uh, so, and we refueled in air, which was pretty interesting to watch. I'd never seen it done before. And, uh, uh, but our pilots were great. I mean, they were fantastic. So we, uh, it was about a three and a half hour flight from uh, Eudorn into Sante. And we were basically flying treetop level, just above the terrain and uh, following. It looked like a flock of geese flying in, what it looked like. And uh, as we approached the uh, Sante PLW camp, the uh, C-130's job was to raise up above the uh, camp and drop flares. And those flares were to light up the camp, and which they did. Uh, the, we had two spare HH-53s because if we had mechanical or if we had more POWs than we anticipated, we could have brought more back because those HH-53s a whole probably 25, 30, 40 people. Oh, yeah. They're a big bird, yeah. So uh, when, uh, when we were getting ready to land, uh, the lead bird was Apple One. That was its call sign. We were in Apple Two, so Green Leaf was in Apple One, Red Wine was in Apple Two, and Blue Boy was in the HH3. Uh, what happened at that time is the choppers came in over the compound. There were three guard towers and their job was to take out one of those uh, guard towers on their way in. The, we were gonna drop out at, in a rice paddy field next to the compound while Blue Boy landed inside the compound, or, or POW camp. Uh, due to the hurricane that was coming in, the winds were kind of blowing us a, a little bit and it, it kind of felt like we were, lead chopper was blown off. And there was a uh, school not too far from it, about 500 meters from Sante. And unfortunately, or fortunately actually for us, Green or, uh, Apple One landed at that compound. And Greenleaf guys got off just like we got off, shooting at anything that moved in front of you. And uh, fortunately, uh, the element of surprise, uh, there was an estimate of probably 75 to 100 guys over there that they uh, neutralized. And the good thing about that was, as close as they were, and we didn't really take them into consideration when we were doing our, our, our rehearsals, that those guys could have came over and it could have really made things a little difficult for 56 of us and uh, at that time well over 100, 150 of them. And uh, so the pilot for Apple One saw what he had done and came back, hooked back around and dropped back down and picked him up. Well, in the meantime, while that was taking place, because we had done so many rehearsals and we had alternate plans, uh, and I was the RTO for, our, uh, for Red Wine, as we were feathering in, I heard Plan Green over, Plan Green over. And I thought, oh man, that, I didn't hear that right. So I came back on and said, say again. And uh, the RTO the, for Colonel Sidnor, who was setting up his shop, uh, told us we were going to plan green. Now, what that meant to everyone in the HH3 and Red Wine was that Greenleaf had either been shot down or had engine trouble. But regardless, it meant we didn't have another 22 guys wow. to help us do our job. So, uh, but because of the training we had done in the rehearsal, it was like clockwork. We knew exactly what our mission was and how to perform it. So we went into Plan Green. And our objective, uh, about that time when I, we were feathering down, I turned to Dan Turner, who was the captain 
of the red red wine element. I told him what it was, and he got that old crap look on his face and said, "Well, pass it on." So I we started passing it down through the line. But uh, about that same time, there was a minigun to my right, and he opened fire. And I can tell you right now, that scared the crap out of me. <laughs> you know, I mean, you we had done it in training, but not to that extent yeah. and uh, plus with what was going on. Yeah. Now the minigun's job was to, uh, th there was a guard house and that's what we had moved. We had to take out the guards plus get to the communications. Now there was a bridge over the Sog River we were gonna blow because of being 20 miles, 20, 23 miles from Hanoi. Uh, we expected that there would probably be somebody coming in for reinforcements. So we didn't, because we went to Plan Green, we didn't blow the bridge, but what we, at that, we also had uh, A1Es flying figure eights over us, but we always had cover. And uh, the, their job was, should anybody be coming down that road, they were gonna take them out. Yeah. So, and, and those guys we had on the A1Es were, <laughs> we were training one day and we were just jacking around with them a little bit and said, how close can you bring them in? And one of the guys, uh, Lieutenant Payne was kind of a pain, but he was a <laughs> damn good flyer. And uh, he came in, he brought rounds in probably 30 feet from us. Oh, Lord. Yeah. That's, a, that's good enough <laughs> yeah. to wave off. Yeah, exactly. I thought, holy, I'm glad he's on our side. Yeah. But he was just showing us how good he was. <laughs> but uh, he, he was a very good pilot, too. So we had the cover. And of course, over them, we had weasels and F-4s flying for the MiGs. Um, so we went ahead and executed our, our, what we had been trained to do. And in the meantime, when Apple One went over to pick up the guys, they came back and dropped them off right where they should have initially. So there was a little bit of a, let's get coordinated. I mean, they got off kind of like we did and shooting at everybody in front of me, but uh, we initially, uh, it seemed like it took maybe longer than ever, but it was probably a minute at the most yeah, to get yeah. everybody together, you know. Uh, the, the disadvantage we have compared to today's warrior is our radio, I had a Prick 25 and that was how we communicated, you know, and hand signals and, hey, <laughs> yeah. do this, you know. And, yeah. Old school. Old school. No way around it. No way around it, exactly. I mean, no night vision. Uh, our, our night vision was World War II goggles, <laughs> ski <laughs> goggles, you know, you had amber or white. Yeah. And basically it was to, to help on the kick up of the crap coming when yeah, the choppers and, and took off. And flares too. Yes, and, and those so bright. Yeah, those bla oh yeah, those things, I mean, they, they lit it up like a Christmas tree when they came down. So, uh, so anyway, we executed, uh, Captain Turner and myself, and cleared the buildings we were to clear and our bullet told us that our mission was not to take the OWs so to neutralize anybody as we went through so we were going to be coming back to that same area and he didn't want anybody holding us down while reinforcements would come so they they estimated the maximum time on ground would be 30 minutes before they would be coming from uh, Hanoi and I think we were on the ground 29 so yeah. it was pretty down close. And uh, the, yeah, so when there was, we were heading to the communication building, which was our challenge is to, uh, Captain Turner and I, was to take that, neutralize the people in there so they wouldn't be calling for re reinforcements. Yeah. And just as we got to that building, I heard another bad news. I, my radio was just full of bad news that night. <laughs> I thought it was fake news at all. <laughs> but, uh, they, uh, the word came on, I heard them say negative items. Now item was a code name for POWs. So Colonel Sidnor said for him to check again. By this time, Bull Simons had uh, teamed up with the, the command group too. And uh, so they, were, they said check it again. And they went back and did a recheck, making sure, because the last thing we wanted to do wow. is leave anybody from America there on the, on the the camp. So they checked again and then they told us to extract and we started uh, our extraction process and uh, Dan Turner and I were the last two on our bird and we were taking a head count and uh, we kept coming up short and uh, we count again, you know, it's short. 
third time we realized, or Dan did, they didn't count himself. Yeah, McClam. Yeah, yeah, right. Tease him accordingly for that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, once once we got uh, our count right and uh, we took off and we were coming up and uh, they turned heading south and boy we were looking out over Hanoi. Dan and I were sitting on the tailgate with a PJ between us and uh, we were looking over the Hanoi and it, I mean it was like looking over a huge city in the country in the United States and uh, we hadn't been in the air maybe a minute if that probably and all of a sudden our chopper just like it was we thought we were crashing and about that time here come this big orange pole flying up our tail and I had never seen a SAM missile, didn't know what it was, and so I hollered over Dan what it was, and our PJ told us, SAM missile. <laughs> so that's when we thought, oh crud, <laughs> you know, we're sitting up here sitting ducks on the ground, we can run and hide, <laughs> but yeah. up here, you, but our pilots, I mean, they were dodging them, come find out there was a, a SAM site and a, an anti-aircraft site just about probably three miles from oh, Sante. So, but that night, they, they were, I later heard that there were 16 SAMs fired at us, but I think they were also fired not only at the choppers, but at, <coughs> yeah, the coverage, at coverage yeah. right. So uh, we had one uh, F-4 got hit, and uh, they had to bail out, And uh, but uh, one of the, uh, the choppers that was our extra chopper went by and picked them up. They didn't, they, couldn't pick them up in the day, night that night, so they came back early the next morning and got them and made sure they were safe. And yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. You wouldn't want to leave one on a oh. rescue mission. No, no, no. That's, that's that doesn't look point. good. Then, uh, right. Yeah. Just adding to it. But uh, uh, so we, uh, it was a, a long ride back to to Eudorn and uh, pretty disappointing, you know, all the training and all, everything we went through and the POWs. We later found out the last drone that was flew over the compound was in June, and the next day they moved the POWs. So, and they quit flying over it because they didn't want to tip their hand that this POW camp was being looked at. So, but the outcome of the, the Sante raid, if you talk to any POW, was a, a huge success. 50 years after, the heroism of the Sante raid lives on. If you want to learn more about it, watch out for the documentary and grab a copy of Terry's book, Who Will Go Into the Sante POW Camp. The book is a must read for special operation mission planners, as well as enthusiasts in military history, told by brave men who actually lived it. Thank you to Terry and all the members of Greenleaf, Red Wine and Blue Boy the heroes of the Sante Raid. Please subscribe to my Full 30 and Patreon account. For more videos on safety, military methods, security training and tactics, and weapons handling, don't forget to subscribe to Eric Lawrence VSS and visit eric-lawrence.com for more info. Also come visit shop.vig-sec.com for all the products that I carry.